Okay, I'm going to explain what's happening here by reminding you what we learned in mineralogy when we took a look at the pyroxene quadrilateral. Today, what we're trying to explain is our two fundamental observations that we have two different types of pyroxene with different optical characteristics. Now, we might also need to use a, an electron microscope and an X-ray diffractometer to convince ourselves that these are both pyroxenes and they have different composition. But let's just imagine we've done that. The second observation we're trying to understand is the formation of the X solution lamellae. So what's going on? Recall that we start off with a ternary compositional system where we're looking at wollastonite, a calcium peroxinoid at the top of our triangle. And then at the bottom left, we'll have the composition for enstatite, a magnesium pyroxene, and ferrocylite, an iron-rich pyroxene. But that wollastonite is a peroxinoid should give us a hint that this is not part of our understanding today. So instead, we're going to just chop off the top part of this ternary diagram, making the quadrilateral below. So we've not chopped it anywhere randomly. We've chopped it at a very specific point, which is where we have a pyroxene that has half of its M or metal sites filled with calcium and half of the sites filled with magnesium. And that, of course, is the pyroxene diopside. On the other side, we have the pyroxene Hedenbergite. Can you anticipate what the composition is of Hedenbergite? Hopefully you got that it's a calcium iron pyroxene. So now let's think about what's going on. We have pyroxenes across the bottom of our quadrilateral with no calcium versus pyroxenes that are about half calcium in terms of the metal or M sites and half either iron or magnesium or some variable amount of iron and magnesium. So if we remind ourselves what's going on here from mineralogy, we're talking about all of these elements being in the two plus valence state. However, notice that the size of the calcium ion, and here we're going to correctly use that the calcium is in eightfold coordination, we see that the calcium ion is much larger than the magnesium ion. And I've given you those sizes both in angstroms as well as in the metric nanometers. This creates, this size mismatch creates a problem for our pyroxene lattice. The size mismatch means that we now have the conditions for two different, uh, for two different uh, uh, crystal unit cells to form, one with the monoclinic shape and one with the orthorhombic shape. Notice clinopyroxene, monoclinic, and inclined extinction. I've put those all on the same line to try and help you remember that that's the case. Orthopyroxenes are orthorhombic and they will turn out to have parallel extinction. All right, so going back to our pyroxene quadrilateral, I am now going to call everything that is in this top gray shaded area a clinopyroxene and abbreviate that CPX. I'm going to uh, call all pyroxene compositions along the low, the no calcium, although it might be uh, less than half a percent, but essentially the no calcium pyroxenes are our orthopyroxenes, OPX. And then notice that we have pigeonite, which is going to float somewhere in the middle. And this is a monoclinic pyroxene that has a low amount of calcium in it typically three to six percent calcium. So I've listed the varietal names of the clinopyroxenes. This is why we get this incredible color spectrum in hand sample. 
Audrite itself can be black, brown, or shades of green. So we cannot rely on color as an indicator of our pyroxene identity. Finally, let's talk about X solution. I'm showing you a phase diagram on the left that you may or may not have seen before. We have temperature increasing on the y-axis and we have composition in terms of the amount of calcium in the pyroxene indicated across the, bo the bottom join. So down here at the lower left of the x-axis, zero actually indicates our enstatite composition because we have two magnesiums filling those M sites and no calcium. And then as we move to the right across the bottom, we're getting to our diopside composition. Although you haven't seen this before, I hope it looks familiar to you in, in parallel or similarly to our alkali feldspar system. This is a system with a solvus, meaning that anything in the middle here cannot exist within a single uh, crystal, crystalline lattice. Instead, if we have an intermediate composition, as we decrease our temperature, we're going to have um, an amount of enstatite, pure magnesium orthopyroxene, coexist with an amount of diopside. Now notice in this system, this is a binary system. We have two components, our magnesium, uh, magnesium pyroxene, and we have our diopside pyroxene. But of course we know in nature that we also have to consider the presence of iron. And so instead, Don Lindsley in the 80s, in the early 80s, published these diagrams to show that we could use the pyroxene quadrilateral and indicate which pyroxenes are present at a given set of pressure and temperature conditions by showing a stability field. So here we're talking about uh, surface pressure conditions, one atmosphere conditions, and a temperature of 1200 degrees C. We have orthopyroxene, our enstatitic uh, pyroxene down here at the lower left of our quadrilateral. We have augite and diopside both being able to form a limited but larger range of compositions. And here comes pigeonite as being stable. Now, we may have initially crystallized the pyroxenes of the still water complex at very high temperatures, almost certainly. Uh, the pressure, of course, would be some substantially higher. But then, as the still water complex continues to cool through time, we leave the former high temperature stability conditions and instead reach temperatures closer to 800 degrees C. This is still quite warm, which allows bonds to break and reform even within the solid pyroxene structures. And here with all these arrows, I'm trying to show you that we can have coexisting clinopyroxenes here, and I'm using the purple arrows to point to this large clinopyroxene host that has orthopyroxene uh, X solution lamellae or X solution blebs, and they are lining up, the X solution lamellae are lining up within the crystal structure. Uh, in contrast, we have over to the right here, clinopyroxene X solution lamellae that are currently extinct. We know that's one of the signals that tells us that it is a clinopyroxene in the X solution lamellae. Whereas um, our host pyroxene in this case is the more enstatitic orthopyroxene. I have chosen compositions that are somewhat analogous to the still water, but I have not made a perfect match for the still water. I hope this helps you understand your pyroxenes. Thanks.